My name is Robert Melanson, as you can see there, and you'll very shortly why, and find out why this topic interested me. So, as you can see, that, and also uh, I may start moving very rapidly near the end because I tried this last night and I was 15 or 20 minutes over, but it was too late to edit the slides. So, the topic for today, as you can just see, a, is... Just a comment on that. Since we're now Zooming and people are all home and few of us have subsequent commitments a few minutes after this meeting, um, my suggestion is that if you run out of time, probably just finish it and those people who have to leave can leave. Okay. That's what I thought might happen. So that's why I kept going <laughs> for an hour and 45 minutes just to see what would, how long it would take. Okay, so I'll begin. The topic for today, as you can see, is the science behind Chris Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World in 1492. Here's a portrait of Christopher Columbus, which is his name in English. There is no known authentic portrait of Columbus. The one you see here was painted soon after his death by Sebastiano del Piombo. So possibly he had seen Columbus in the flesh, but it's not certain. So Columbus is La Empress de, da, de la Indias, as he named his enterprise to sail west to arrive in Japan to the east, opened up the new world to permanent European colonization. Thus I dodged the issue of whether he discovered America. The squiggles beside his portrait are his signature. He was sort of a character. 500 years and hundreds of efforts have gone into trying to figure out what it means, but it appears there never will be an explanation. So let's start with why this topic interests me. Here we have a map of the South North Atlantic showing the track of Columbus's first voyage. On the next slide, we see a map showing part of the Caribbean, actually most of it and the path of another great voyage, this time shown in red. The black track shows approximately where Columbus first landed in the Bahamas and that he proceeded to Cuba and Hispaniola, which is now the Dominican Republic and Haiti. The red track shows my voyage in 1990 from Road Town Tortola to South Miami, Florida to deliver my boat, a Beneteau 42, to a sales broker. My boat had been sitting in Totola for two years being repaired after its charter life was over, and I was paying half the mortgage for that entire period. The boat sold about a month later, so this was indeed a great voyage, at least from my perspective. As you can guess, I am interested in anything involving sailing, and thus, how did Columbus do it? The one thing I remember on my trip in is the water in the Bahamas and how clear it was. It took, looked about two feet deep to me and I was petrified the whole time I was sailing there. A few times I actually stopped and jumped into the water to verify that it was deep enough. Who needs a lead line was what was going through my mind. I wonder what Columbus, oh, it's just parenthetically, I sailed there about 18 times and I always jumped in to see how deep the water was and going into a port with reefs. I wonder what Columbus thought of the water depth before and after he ran aground and sunk the Santa Maria on Hispanola uh, that Christmas Eve. <laughs> so, oops. I thought I'd start out with a brief agenda to give a hint of where we'll be going. First, in two slides, we'll see a brief summary of the state of Europe in the middle to late 15th century. Some of these undercurrents supplied the impetus for sea exploration in general and more specifically for finding a sea route to the Far East. As you might guess, wealth was the prime motivator. To briefly examine Columbus the person, his family, his education, his sailing and training experience, and his petitions to fund his enterprise. And three, then we will look into the voyage themselves, focusing on the science that enabled him to get to the new world and thus become fabulously wealthy, his primary goal, and incidentally gain great fame. 
we also will look at the science of the Columbian Exchange. Now we, sh now we shall briefly look at the state of Europe in the 15th century. A deep sense of despair pervaded the privileged classes. There was little sense of forward progress and there was widespread decay of institutions. For example, Catholicism, a key element in Italian and Spanish and Columbus's and Italian and Spanish society was in decline. Evidence of this is one, the Crusades were long over, but the goal had not been achieved. There was still discussion of resurrecting Italy, but mostly to prevent France from attacking Italy. France did famously go to war with Italy. Interestingly, whenever this war is brought up, the name Christopher Columbus is sure to be mentioned as his name became synonymous with why the war is famous. Two, the Western Schism, i.e. two popes, ended a short while uh, before Columbus was born, after roiling Christianity for 40 years. The current pope, number three, Alexander VI, was blatantly corrupt and ambitious. His mistresses and children abounded. However, at least there was only one pope. For Alexander's neglect of the spiritual aspects of the search would soon lead to the Protestant Reformation. And five, most important for our purposes, Christian Jim was shrinking in area while Islam, i.e. the Ottoman Empire, was expanding. At its height, Islam was knocking on the gates of Vienna in the famous battle there. More to the point, this expansion was detrimental to the Enormous profits for Genoa and Venice from the overland trade with the Far East. Columbus would most certainly have been aware of this, as he was, as we'll see, he was born in Genoa. In addition to the decline in Catholicism, university enrollment was dwindling and its content seemed increasingly irrelevant. And for over a century, there had been no important advance in natural science. For example, Copernic, Copernicus' publication on the revolutions of the celestial sphere, spheres was 50, miles, 50 years away, so the universe still revolved around the Earth. To continue with the mood of despair, and finally unchecked environment, environmental degradation was taking a toll. Trees and forests were becoming scarce. Trees suitable for ship mass were non-existent, and there were few edible fish in rivers because of the runoff due to the lack of forests. Bottom line, opportunities were diminishing and nations that could were going to sea to find new resources. On the other hand, in 1439, Gutenberg developed the movable type printing press. I regard this as one of the great inventions of all time for humankind. As a result, Columbus couldn't, could afford an extensive library and therein wrote numerous comments in the margins. That is finally some, you'll come to realize, finally some hard documentation of his thinking. Another, on the other hand, Portugal was aggressively exploring the Atlantic off the coast of Africa, colonizing the islands they found and establishing trade with Africa, mostly the slave trade, which Columbus must have witnessed in his travels. More to the point here, Portugal was trying to find a sea route to the Far East by going around Africa. As a result, shipbuilding technology made rapid strides in seaworthiness and sailing capability in the early 14 and middle 1400s. This was key to exploring Afri the African coast, which required strong construction and adequate upwind sailing. This was also key for Columbus's voyages. Uh, Spain was united by marriage of Ferdinand I, I guess, and Isabella in 1469, which then enabled Spain to afford it to wage a war against Islam in Granada. This was uh, important to Columbus, since Spain was not going to fund his enterprise while waging that, that war. Incidentally, the Italian Renaissance was starting to spill over into Spain in the 1400s. But all in all, it seemed to say, safe to say that Europe was in a deep funk. Now for a few pieces of Columbus's personal life. He was born in the Republic of Genoa in August 
to October 1451 to Domenico Colombo and Susanna Fontana Rosa. His father was a master weaver of wool and part of the lower middle class. His mother, on the other hand, was from a wealthy upper class family. No one mentioned this in any of the books I read, um, but his mother's social standing seems significant to me. He would have thus learned how to present himself and relate to the privileged class which, as you'll see, he was superb at. In addition, Genoa was one of the two major naval and trading powers in what was to become Italy. Thus, we can understand Columbus's attraction to the sea and gaining wealth from its possibilities. He would also have been very aware of Islam's interference in the overland silk trade route. They were upping the tolls and tariffs uh, unmercifully. He had two brothers of significance in his life, Bartholomew, who was a cartographer, um, and Giacomo, his Italian name, and Diego, his English name, who was 17 years younger. Um, and actually, uh, I'll cover that later. He was a devout and committed Catholic, utterly steadfast in his faith. He personally led Vespers every morning and evening on his voyages. He, actually met his wife in church. Now a few more tidbits of his personal life. He married Philippa Perestrial Al Almanis, daughter of a wealthy Portuguese nobleman, nobleman. Thus, Columbus became a Portuguese nobleman himself. This gave him entree to the Portuguese and Spanish courts because his father-in-law was well-connected in Spain as well. Columbus had two children, one by his wife named Diego and one with his mistress after Felipe's death named Fernando. Both children and his brother were involved with him throughout his life. Physically, he was reportedly tall of stature, powerfully built, had a ruddy complexion and red hair. Thus, he was more than capable of uh, commanding men physically. Incidentally, these are not the typical Italian physical attributes. He died on May 20th, 1506 in uh, Bello Dalid, Spain, a very wealthy man. True to his explorer nature, he continued to move around after his death. I think he's in Seville at the moment. So now let's look at his early life briefly, very briefly starting with his childhood and teen years. He moved around after his death? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he well, actually, he didn't do it himself. He, they moved him around a few okay. times. <laughs> oh, uh, damn. He was one of those. Uh, I think it happened to a number of the people in that era. That was sort of a little joke. <laughs> um, there is little to no document evidence of his activities in this period, i.e. all assertions are conjecture working backwards from what he did in later life. My thought was, why should there be any records? He was totally unnoteworthy at this point in his life. This is a bit of a surprise. He had no formal education. He never wrote in Italian. This seems remarkable for someone who had become a successful business agent for both important families and learned to speak, read, and write in Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin. He almost certainly spent considerable time sailing as a seaman, as we shall see in the next slide. It's hard to explain how he could become an accomplished captain without a solid and lengthy sailing background. More to the point of this presentation, we'll now look quickly at his possible early sailing experience. In one of his writings, in um, he claimed he went to sea at the age of 10, which would have been 1461, but obviously this is speculative. At 14, he may have sailed a small boat up and down the coast, buying and delivering wool and cloth as farther. Both of these are mentioned quite a bit in the books I read, so it's, they are speculative, but who knows? The next six years are largely undocumented as are the four, first 14, for that matter. So in 1473, we have the first written record. At the age of 23, is known to have sailed to Chios, Greece, 
as a business agent for the important Spinola family, i.e. a very responsible position. And in 1474, Columbus begins a series of voyages over the next six, seven years, which take him to faraway lands such as Guinea, Africa, and Iceland. He becomes a knowledgeable seaman, well-versed in the basics of sailing, distance, speed, reefing, anchoring, etc. More important, he learned of the trade winds off the coast of Africa, the key insight that enabled him to reach the new world when all others failed. Also, he became acquainted with the African slave trade, for better or for worse. Now, for a bit of a surprise, his big splash and break in life. In 1476, at the age of 25, fate enters the picture and, and the ship he is on sinks off the coast of Portugal. He is aboard a ship named Bachella, which is part of a large trading fleet, and a, again, as a business agent for an important family. His fleet is attacked by an equally large fleet of French Portuguese warships for no apparent reason other than to steal the cargo. I don't think there was much difference between warships and pirates in those days. At the end of the day, four warships and three cargo ships are sunk. Bachella was one of, or his ship was one of the ships that sunk. Columbus jumps into the ocean and swims six miles to shore in spite of being wounded. And as odd as it seems, this appears to be divine intervention, setting his life on the path to wealth and fame. He travels to the large Genoa enclave in Lisbon, where he and his wounds are well treated and he recovers fully. He is thus thrust into the most advanced sailing community in Europe. Columbus soon proves to be a very apt student. He continues sailing briefly and then returns to Lisbon for his formal sailing education. 1477, he's back in Lisbon as a student learning navigation and seamanship, i.e. everything nautical. This is also when he learns to speak, read, and write Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin, which I find rather impressive. Uh, he reads widely about astronomy, geography, and history, including the works of Ptolemy, it was Claudius Ptolemy, the travels of Marco Polo and Sir John Mandeville. Um, it was almost as famous as Marco Polo, I discovered, and Pliny's natural history. Ptolemy was uh, an acknowledged geographical authority for some reason at this period, even though he had been dead for over 1,300 years. Columbus was not a scholarly man, but he was obviously intelligent, ambitious, and calculating. He studied the authors mentioned above, made hundreds of notations in the margins, and came out with clear ideas of the world, some of which were pretty far off, as we'll see. But so were everyone else's. Maybe he was already thinking about the enterprise as something he could do at this point. However, it is not clear when he started thinking about the enterprise in this way. Now for some unrelated and but important ancillary life experiences. 1479 takes time out from his voyaging to marry Philippa Prestello Amanas, daughter of a wealthy Portuguese nobleman, sea captain, and explorer colonizer. Just one of those, another one of those smart moves he made throughout his life. His new position within the nobility helps him get audiences with the King of Portugal and later Spain. It also labels him as an up-and-comer. The idea of him doing the sailing west of the Indies must have occurred to him by this time, around 1480. His father-in-law was an Atlantic colonizer and respected sea captain. Columbus acquired from his widow the charts and documents describing his Atlantic voyages. These excited him greatly. I believe Columbus must have consulted with a number of experts to put together his proposal to the monarchies of Portugal and Spain. His father-in-law corresponded with an astronomer named Toscanelli, who was very well respected, who interestingly made the first proposal of going, the very first proposal of going west to go to the Far East. He did this to the King of Portugal in 1470, which was a decade earlier. 
Columbus also had contact with Toscanelli, who died in 1481. Toscanelli had sent Columbus one of his World According to Toscanelli maps a few years earlier. Thus, Columbus and his father were independently in contact with uh, Toscanelli. Uh, to me, it appears probable that Columbus had been thinking about his enterprise for a while. Now, to sell the enterprise to King John, its second of Portugal. As hinted above, there was no hard evidence concerning exactly when Columbus first thought of the Impressa de la Indias as something he could do. He was not the first to try to go in to try going to Japan by sailing west. Uh, actually, there were a number of others. But he was, you have to keep remembering, no one knew that the old, the new world is there. But he was the first to make a practical proposal. That is, instead of simply going west from Spain, go south to Can the Canaries to pick up the trade winds, which uh, was largely unknown, and as we'll see, pretty much completely unknown to almost everyone else uh, as a concept, and then go west. That's so, from 1485 to 88, Columbus presented his enterprise to King John. It was sent to a succession of committees and eventually rejected, primarily due to his estimate of the distance. 2,400, uh, I don't know if they're nautical or regular miles or some other miles, versus 10,000, as the committee believed. Uh, also, since there were so many failures, the, the committee was very skeptical that it could be done. In fact, but, in fact, King John secretly sent another explorer west to test Columbus's ideas. But this failed once again because, strangely, he simply went west instead of following the proposal exactly. Somehow the committee's dismissed or underestimated the critical difference in Columbus's proposal to trade winds. In fact, several of the committees actually doubted their existence. Uh, I have to remember, this was a new concept, and I'm sure other sailors knew of it from their experience off the coast of Africa, but who knew where they went or ended? So it's safe to say that the trade knowledge of the trade winds was not common knowledge. However, in 1488, the famous explorer named Bartholomew, Bartholomew Diaz um, rounded the Cape of Good Hope, i.e. the around Southern Africa route, which caused King John to turn down Columbus's proposal categorically. Columbus now leaves for Spain, um, actually started his Spanish pitch in 1486, and uh, but possibly trying to play off the two countries against each other. Let's take a quick look at the estimated distance from the Canary Islands to Japan, uh, see why they <laughs> turned down the proposal. The actual distance going from right to left on the first line is 10,600 miles, if you had an airplane. Columbus had 2,400 miles in the uh, red ellipse, and, but he wasn't far off from Toscanelli or this other very uh, well-respected uh, astronomer, Martin Behaim. So what I wonder is why were the com committees so sure of anything? Um, but, but given uh, that I mean, most people didn't sign up, for, most astronomers didn't sign up for this, but Obviously, a few respected ones did. So, but I guess committees, they, they just have to appear authoritative. So they turned him down. Um, however, as we shall see very soon, the Spanish monarchy ultimately pretty much ignores the committee findings, which, so, and also, as we shall very soon see, one wonders how the ancients, I, Aristotle could have had distances so right and how they got turned around into such wrong numbers. First, uh, here's the world according to Toscanelli at that island called C-H-I-P-P-A-N-G-U is Japan. 
you can see it's a little over 3,000 miles away. Actually, I counted the, the longitudes and it's about 3,500 miles away on this map. And uh, here's, so Columbus wasn't bizarrely off. And here's the uh, globe according to Martin Behain. And you can see it's about the same distance away. Obviously, there's no North America. And in both cases, there's islands out in the middle of the Atlantic that aren't really there. So I'm just trying to highlight the, the fact that uh, nothing was known for sure at uh, this point. So next we'll see just very quickly, I'm not going to go through all these steps, but how Columbus arrived at his 2400. Uh, first, Ptolemy taught that the known world covers 180 degrees up to 360. This is already a 50% overestimate. Columbus and other respected geographers, to be fair, insisted this is too small. Too small. Columbus preferred to believe Marinus attire, successive to Ptolemy, who stretched the known world at 225 degrees. To this, Columbus added 28 degrees for the discoveries of Marco Polo and 30 degrees for the distance from China to the east coast of Japan. Why not? <laughs> that was my thought. So he keeps going in that vein. And at the end, you can see, though, he, near the end, you can see he comes with, with 2,400, which is 60 degrees times 40. And, uh, 60 is the amount of Earth not accounted for, which is kind of ludicrous. It should have been something like 170. And 40 is the length of a degree at the 28th parallel, according to Columbus. That's more than a bit off since a degree is supposed to be 60 miles. I don't think it decreases that fast. So just out of interest, curiosity, I looked up uh, or found this table that shows how the ancients viewed the world. And uh, you can see modern, the degree is 60 as it, in nautical miles by definition almost. And the circumference is 21,600 21, miles. And you look at the first two, Aristotle and Erasmus, and they're almost right on. And then you get to Columbus, 16,000. Uh, and so, one wonders how uh, how did it come, how did it get this far off? I don't know. Religion comes to my mind of how this could happen, but anyway, let's see how. Here's actually a bit of science. How did Erasmus get so close? So one day the sun shone at the bottom of the wells in serene Egypt. Erasmus. That's how it's pronounced. Measured the sun's position in the sky over Alexandria. It was seven degrees away from the zenith, meaning serene must be seven degrees away from Alexandria, as measured on the circle that is the Earth's circumference, a great circle. Multiply the distance between serene and Alexandria by 360 over seven to get their circumference. He was about 1% off or less, which I found pretty impressive. I, I don't know how Aristotle did it, but probably something similar. Now to sell the enterprise to Queen uh, Isabella after, it, after getting turned down uh, by John of Portugal. Uh, so in 1486, Columbus had sought an audience with the Spanish monarchs eight, on May 1st permission was having been granted, Columbus presented his plans to Queen Isabella, who naturally in turn refers it to committee. After passing of time, the committee, like the counterparts in Portugal, replied that Columbus had underestimated the distance to Japan and pronounced the idea uh, impractical. This is among other unreasonable, this is reasonable. The other objections, we'll see, we'll look at them briefly, are pretty unreasonable. But in reality, at this time, the monarchy was absorbed with the attack on Granada to displace Islam. And no matter what the committee determined, Columbus was not going to get a final answer until Granada fell. 
However, to keep Columbus from taking his ideas elsewhere, Isabella gave him an allowance of 12,000 maravedis, maravedis, and I tried to find an equivalent uh, modern dollar number, but I couldn't. And in 1489, furnished with a letter providing him with free room and board anywhere in Spain. Next, Columbus gets the almost final thumbs down after a number of years. Basically, the committee findings were not deterministic in any way. The timing of the verdict was delayed and explicitly until Granada was taken. There were several intervening committees. These all determined Columbus was way off with respect to distance. But Isabella, did, as you may have gathered, Isabella was doing the evaluating, not Ferdinand. And near the end, Isabella gave him 20,000 Maravellis and continued free food to uh, keep him from going elsewhere. 1491, Columbus made his first proposal for his remuneration demands. Admiral of the Ocean Seas was the first, which meant all the seas he claimed he would be in charge of. 10% of all proceeds, governor of all he finds, and kick in one eighth, get one eighth. Of the, so if he kicked in it one eighth of any private venture, he'd get an eighth of the proceeds. Here's what astonishes me. Keep in mind, we are talking about the Far East, not the Bahamas. That is Japan, China, and India. Could the monarchy really believe that these established countries would just cede their dominion religion and religions to Columbus? The answer appears to be yes, believe it or not because the Catholic God, the one God, was on their side. I would say the word delusional comes to my mind. Anyway, Granada capitulated on January 2nd, 1492, and a very short while, Isabella uh, felled the uh, metaphorical ax on Columbus uh, and his proposal. It looked like the end. Columbus had spent six and a half years. He was pretty depressed, I'm sure. And so he took off for France to try to sell the idea there. So, but if you think Columbus's proposal had serious shortcomings, let's look at one of the committee's findings. Actually, I'm just going to do the two uh, in bold. The... Uh, one of them, the existence of Japan is doubted because Ptolemy mentioned no such place. On the other hand, those two astronomers, ge geographers, uh, they were on their maps of the world. Uh, it's, it's, this seems a little strange to me. Um, and the commission doubted fair winds, i.e. the trade winds. So it's clear that the knowledge of the trade winds was very limited at this point. And uh, Columbus was one was probably the only one who thought he could take advantage of them. So what happens next since we know Columbus actually did do it, the trip? So uh, he was on his way to France. However, Isabella finally sees the light and green lights the enterprise. How could this come about? It turns out Columbus had made a friend, as he often did with royalty, of Louis de Santa Gel, none other than the treasurer of King Ferdinand. Louis approached Isabella and pointed out the obvious fact that she was being short-sighted, although she probably, he probably thought of it that she was being stupid. Genoa and Venice had the overland route, Portugal had the Cape of Good route, and Spain had nothing. She apparently did offer, as I read in several books, to pawn her jewels at this time, but Louis, who was very wealthy, as well as being royal treasurer, told her if money was a consideration, he would gladly pay for it. So Isabella saw the light, summoned Columbus to return, and okayed the venture. Then we come to the matter of Columbus's steep demands. Isabella elected not to challenge them. However, the queen then ordered at Louis's suggestion that the town of Palos charter two of the boats, eventually Nina and Pinta, and 
as punishment for some minus, minor uh, transgression, which no one ever mentions. Now, so on to chartering the chips and ships and recruiting the crew. After a few months of ironing out the details, he uh, proceeds to Palos and charters a third boat, which is a medium size. Oh, the town grants him uh, two boats, which are um, caravels, uh, rather grudgingly, because they're paying the taxes for them. And Columbus chartered a third boat, uh, which is, became is the Santa Maria, which is a now or Carrack. And he pays for half of it. He's borrowing all this money, so pressure is increasing. Um, it's larger than the other two boats, and it becomes his flagship. The Enterprise is now at a critical crossroads. The town-provided boats are modest, which is a polite word for sort of junk, and the crew so far is marginal. You have to think, why would a competent seaman sign up with an unknown captain on a very risky venture? However, as usual, good fortune smiles again on him. A local named Martin Alonzo Pinzon returns from a trip uh, in the nick of time and decides to team up with Columbus. It is safe to say that Martin, due to his prestige and exceptional expertise in all matters, played almost in, as important a role in the enterprise as Columbus. Without him, it is doubtful that the enterprise could have succeeded. He was a highly respected, highly regarded Spanish mariner, shipbuilder, navigator, and explorer, and the older of the Pinson brothers. He was exceedingly keen about the enterprise. He happened to own two top-notch caravels, Nina and Pinto. As a strong sign of his commitment, Martin put up half, Martin put up half a million caravels, basically half the sum put up by the monarchy. He dismissed the two modest boats provided by Palos and offered his own, the Nina and Pinto. He also dismissed the crew Columbus recruited and was able to enlist a highly qualified crew. Each boat had a surgeon, carpenters, and the crew was perfectly capable of making major repairs at any time, as they had to a few times. He sailed with Christopher Columbus on the first voyage as captain of the Pinta, and may have been a more cap competent captain, but probably not by much. So now we come to the crew and their living conditions. Martin's younger brother, Vincent, was captain of the Nina, and the middle brother, Francisco, was first mate of the Pinta. Pinta. Safe to say the Pinzons were all in on this venture. As I've read elsewhere, there were indeed a few prisoners, uh, four, and they were pardoned. They must have been, but however, they must have been very experienced seamen given the living conditions. This I find a bit shocking. Living conditions were spartan, to say the least. The crew, except the captain, had to sleep on the very hard, curved deck. Thus, experienced seamen were a must. The captain slept inside under a roof, but his quarters were about four feet high, certainly not luxurious. Food was consistent with the normal Spanish diet, wine and water and large casks. For food to last, it needed to be dry. Staples included dried and salted anchovies and cod, pickled or salted beef or pork, dried grains like chickpeas, lentils and beans, and of course, hardtack biscuits. No, it's just out of interest. I looked up vitamin C and scurvy, and uh, there was no vitamin C provided. That was discovered, the need for it was discovered in 1753. Food was cooked, if at all, on deck in something of a pit. There was no official cook. Now for the, we'll get into the caravel uh, characteristics and why they were so suitable um, for this venture. Uh, in fact, very little is known precisely about any of the exact the ships. However, it's probably safe to assume they were similar to other caravels of this period. 
all major voyages of this period, including Magellan in 1522, used the caravel. As we shall see, they were sturdy, fast, and nimble. They also had relatively shallow draft, which made, made them ideal for exploration. The Nini and Pinta were probably about 50 feet long with a beam of a little over 14 feet, or a ratio of three and a half to one, which is important, as we'll see. They have displacement hulls, and thus, I won't read the formula, that's the standard formula for a hull speed of a displacement hull, and it came out to eight nines, so there's probably about eight knots. All had three masts, a few caravels later on had four, but they were three-masted. Nina was a caravel of Latina, which means she had three Latin or triangular sails, while Pinta was a caravel of Redonda, which means she had square sails on the forward two masts. As will be explained, all Latin sails would be dangerous in the conditions Columbus anticipates. Ballast was a vital consideration. Typically heavy cargo or some stones at the bottom of the boat served as ballast and then thus got the center of mass uh, as low as possible in the boat. Uh, and this made for a, a good writing moment or a lever arm, if you think of it as that, to write the ship if it's gonna list. And another surprise to me, no wind, a little problem. Uh, these boats could be rowed quite easily at two knots or so. And Columbus probably didn't know it, but he was at the northern edge of the trade winds when he was sailing and could easily have been becalmed for a week or more. He did get a few days of calm, but true to his good fortune, a prolonged uh, calm didn't happen. Now, what do we look at next? Ah, a picture of the, uh, it's actually a model of the Nina, and, uh, which was Columbus's favorite boat, also Pin, uh, Martin's favorite boat. And just looking at this picture, you can see that the boom is on the, uh, this isn't actually written up anywhere. This is me observing that notice the boom is on the leeward side of the boat and it's very long. And when the boat comes about or tacks or jibes, the boom must be moved to the other side, uh, which was not easy as uh, they, I read the procedure and it was non-trivial. Thus a flying jibe and heavy wind could be disastrous as it is on a modern sailboat. Uh, and next we come to what I consider a beautiful painting of the three. Um, and it looks to me like they're on a port tack. And uh, given that you can see Nina off in the distance still has the Latin sails, they must have been heading toward the, uh, the what is it, Canary Islands uh, at this point. Because um, they wouldn't they probably would have been on a starboard tack heading to the new world, at least as I have experienced the winds in my 18 or so trips there, to the Caribbean, that is. So I mentioned that the construction improvements had been uh, quite instrumental in making Caravel capable of offshore voyages, and I found these interesting. Uh, here, this is a list of them. First, the rudder was moved from the side to the rear of the ship, allowing more precise control and heavier following seas. However, this limited the view of the seas and the compass with the helmsman. But uh, always another person was assigned to watch the compass. My guess is that this was a double check mechanism in case the, uh, the helmsman got confused, which I can testify can happen. The next one, the keel, ribs, and planks were made substantially heavier. The ribs were the things that go up the side that the planks or sides were attached to. So it became quite a bit sturdier. In fact, the planks or sides were three to five inches thick at this point. The ribs were fashioned to give the boat a, an elliptical shape below the waterline as opposed to circular for the now. 
thus the caracal is faster than the now and has friendlier sea motion. However, the reason they didn't do not, this would limit the cargo capacity, which why it was tip, not typical for cargo ships. The sides were attached using the planking or non-overlapping method as opposed to the clinker method, which we'll see on the next page. These boats were used around the Cape of Good Hope, which demands very sturdy construction, and the bulge of Ar Africa, which requires reasonable pointing. Clink construction would not survive those uh, Cape of Good Hope, I'm pretty sure at least. Also, maintenance is possible with the planking method. The length overall was also increased over time from a ratio of two to one to three and a half one. I think this is reasonable for uh, up, this is important for reasonable upwind performance. So the physics will be explained shortly, I hope. So now what is a clinker or, uh, this we're happening again, we're in that slide here it is. Somehow they got out of order. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, they did. Um, so here's the two construction techniques. You can see the clinker there overlapped and caravel or uh, plank construction, as it was called in the other screen um, and in the books I read. Uh, show they're just butted end to end. And at first glance, to me, it looked like clinker would be stronger, but they can work loose under heavy seas and leak. And uh, these boats always leak. But the advantage of the caravel was that the gaps were filled with, uh, with rope soaked in tar. So while underway, if a leak developed, you just stuffed more rope soaked with tar in the gap and uh, leaks were kept uh, under control. You know, the had, boat had to be pumped out every day or twice a day, but if they, the leak got ahead of them, they were in trouble. So now we'll, <laughs> since this was my, one of my chief interests, we'll look at the physics of sailing into the wind. Something that's perplexed me since I started sailing and I bought the most common explanation. So, as I said, I hope no one's questioning how a boat sails downwind. So now we'll go back one, and uh, here we see the compass rose, um, which, which is circa 1490s, which is the one Columbus would have had. And uh, the points of sail are the ones his compass would have had. And a modern boat, as you can see, that grayish area, modern boat tacks through 90 degrees. And, well, at least I know that, <laughs> but a boat of that era could only tack through about 120. So they didn't go upwind as well as modern boats, but it was still sufficient. So how on earth does a sailboat go upwind? So now we hit a uh, science finally, and we hit the science of sailing into the wind. How is it possible? Um, the physics of sailing into the wind can be summarized in one word, lift. Obviously, air, a compressible fluid, flowing around a wing, an airfoil, as is a sail, somehow provide li provides lift. That is, the airplane does go up after all, and the, sail and the sailboat does go forward. How can the physics be explained? As a note that a wing and a sail are both an airfoil and just and thus achieve lift using the same physical principles. Look at these principles in some detail in the next few slides. The reigning question for me is why doesn't a sailboat just go sideways when going upwind, i.e. go downwind? The answer is once again lift, this time provided by the water and incompressible fluid flowing over the keel, another foil, a symmetrical foil in this case, to make it a little more confusing. Slides below show the three favorite incorrect theories for sailing into the wind. The first one shows the most common theory and the one that I have accepted for years, but it bothered my intuition for my entire sailing life, as I'll explain. 
the fourth page shows the truth in, in more than somewhat uh, abstract fashion. So here's the most popular lift. It's called the equal transit time lift. Um, the basic idea that the molecules on the top have a longer distance to travel to meet up with their friends and thus go faster and thus produce lift on the top of the um, wing or sail due to the Bernoulli effect. This is the theory I subscribe to. I'm not going to read what's on the slide. I'm just <laughs> plunging ahead with my thoughts. However, as I said, Above, there was always a nagging doubt when it came to a sail. The sail is very thin. How could much of a pressure difference develop on the leeward side of the sail if those pesky little oxygen and nitrogen molecules are destined to meet up? They just can't have much of a speed difference given the middle difference in dis the minimal difference in distance. I don't know why I bought the explanation for so long with that doubt. But I did. But this proofy, proof theory is not completely wrong. It's actually the equal time, transit time, that's completely wrong. As you can see in this wind tunnel picture, the top, over the top, the little air molecules go much faster than the ones in the bottom, which makes perfect sense, to me at least. It's hard to believe the airplane would get off the ground if they were going the same speed, almost the same speed as the ones on the bottom. Now, I guess that always bothered me too, but the planes always took off. So next, we look at the next theory, the Newtonian theory, or conservation of momentum theory. Um, it's basically that those air molecules hit the bottom and bounce downward and provide lift in that fashion by simple conservation of momentum. And surprising, this theory isn't completely wrong either, but it certainly doesn't account for how uh, an airplane gets off the ground or a sail makes the boat go forward. And then we get to theory three, which makes intuitive sense to me that, uh, that the free stream above sandwiching the air uh, above the wing into a what is a voluntary nozzle in theory um, provide and the wind goes much the air goes fast much faster and provides lift which it probably would and the airplane or goes up this theory is a, a completely bogus uh, it turns out the airstream or free stream as it's in the diagram doesn't anywhere produce enough constriction to account for uh, to, to make it a, uh, what is it, a Venturi nozzle. So uh, this theory is actually completely bogus. Although in some way it makes more sense to me. Anyway, um, here's the correct theory. You notice there's no pictures. <laughs> um, and you notice all these slides came from NASA, so I trust them, <laughs> I guess. Um, so what you see, probably most of you realize, is a bunch of... Uh, partial differential equations that model the uh, airstream. And there, I believe E-U-L-E-R is pronounced Euler, not Euler. So that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. Uh, so as NASA claims that Euler's partial di differential equations uh, on this slide explain the situation. And uh, I'm going to try to give a more intuitive explanation below from other sources. So now we can finally sail into wind. So actually the first two incorrect theories, Bernoulli and momentum with the, the proper angle attack contain most elements of the correct theory. And, a, and, a, and in reality, Euler's equations are simplification of the more general Navier strokes equations of fluid dynamics which I guess would account for it perfectly. However, even the Euler equations are typically much too complex to solve. So simplified approximations are used and high-powered computers are used to model the situation. Um, so once and for all, 
it is clear from the wind tunnel picture that air molecules do not meet up at the end of the wing sail foil, and thus molecules traveling over the longer distance of an asymmetrical wing or sail are free to go much faster and provide, thus provide substantial lift. On the other hand, the Wright brothers' planes were not asymmetrical, and that flew so, and on the uh, NASA pages, they give lots of examples of tests you can perform, like turning the wing upside down, and it's kind of mind-boggling to me, but the plane still flies. <laughs> uh, so that, that's one way they prove the correctness of their statements. So more to the point, this answers my thin foil or sail question. How can the air on the leeward, leeward side of a very thin sail be going enough faster than the windward side to develop sufficient lift to move the boat? Well, the answer is they don't meet up and the air goes much faster on the leeward side. Now for a diagram to show the situation a little more intuitively. And um, here you can see um, that there's lift at both sides of the wing and the documentation I found said, um, said that the lift on the top is obviously due to the Bernoulli effect um, with the air moving much faster than the bottom of the wing and it accounts for 70 to 75 percent of the lift and the bumping <laughs> molecules on the bottom do provide a bit of lift and um, they account for 25 to 30 percent of the lift. I suspect for the Wright brothers it was a much higher percentage. You can also see in these diagrams the angle is a attack is very important that if you make it too steep, obviously if you turn it uh, perpendicular to the ground, it's, you're gonna get nowhere. But if you make it uh, too much of an angle attack, you start getting turbulence, which is deadly to lift. Finally, you may have noticed I used the most lift above. There is another effect called the coanda effect, which is that um, molecules tend to follow a curving surface and uh, you can see that in the diagrams. And there is a little lift at the end of the wing by this effect, but it really comes into play when the plane is landing and they put the flaps down and the air follows the flap and gives quite a bit more lift at low speed. Um, so, but I'm going to ignore that for <laughs> at the moment. So, this is, uh, I made this slide up. <laughs> I didn't read this on the NASA site or anywhere. And I can't believe they never discussed why does the air on the longer side go so fast? Because that seemed to me to be critical to this, <laughs> the, to the correct theory. So I finally found an article at this on Wikipedia that gives extremely extensive discussion of every aspect of lift, including everything on the NASA pages. And as I said, NASA seemed to leave this out and their accounting, the wiki answer is that the deflected air probably at the leading edge creates a vacuum that makes the air go much faster. If anyone else has any ideas, <laughs> let me know. But that, when I read that, I said, ah, ah that, answered the question for me. Um, and once again, parenthetically, there also is the Coanda effect for uh, if you're going slower and lower the flaps. So now we just, we've answered the sail or wing question. The next and last consideration is why doesn't the boat just go sideways? If you don't sail, you probably don't understand what I'm talking about that uh, I ask this question all the time. And in fact, I can demonstrate uh, with my boat, which is about a 12, oh, it doesn't apply to lighter boats, but my boat weighs about six tons. And uh, I can demonstrate sailing sideways going upwind very easily. So first keep in mind that air is a compressible medium and water is not. And separate versions of oil is 
formulas apply. So the next slide demonstrate that there is indeed lift, and then I will explain where it comes from in the following slide. So this slide is a picture of how the uh, Nina and Pinta came about, and in fact, exactly how my boat comes about. Um, and the thing to note is, so the boat is coming along from the right to left, and it's on a starboard tack, and it comes about, if it came, just came about, it would follow the red line. And I can tell you for certainty, if I do that, I will start sailing sideways in the direction of the arrow because there's no lift, because the boat is stopped dead in the water. So what I do, and this boat does, is fall off 15, 20 degrees, pick up speed, and then head up into the, at 45 degrees from the wind, and move along nicely. So in my mind, I mean, this proves there's lift, because my boat wouldn't go anywhere without that speed and the lift provided by the keel and the hull. And the next uh, slide explains how it happens. Um, and um, a keel is a symmetric foil. So if the water was flowing on both sides equally, it wouldn't provide any lift whatsoever. But the lift is provided because the keel has a certain angle of attack relative to the flow of water. As the boat moves forward, it is also moving a bit downwind. And sailors refer to this as this side maze movement as leeway. And this produces an asymmetric flow with the apparent direction of the flow coming from slightly to the downwind side. The flow were coming from directly in front, we get no lift. And it's, uh, but we do get lift. And now, and looking at, I guess the only way to really understand this is looking at the center, the center picture. The boat is actually moving in the direction of the arrow pointing at the keel, not the straight ahead. And if you think about this long enough, you realize this is exactly the picture of a wing. <laughs> and that means lift is developed via the Bernoulli principle on the left-hand side, which is the upwind side, and the boat goes straight. And it, this also applies to the hull, because when you think about the caravel, it has no keel, but it does have a hull, which basically mimics a full hull uh, sailboat. And I believe this is why they had to increase, to get reasonable upwind performance, they, over time, because it originally was about two to one ratio, they increased it to three and a half to one, which provided enough water or lift on the upwind side to make the boat point reasonably well. And I very much doubt they understood uh, this principle, but they did understand it didn't go upwind when it was shorter and it did go upwind when it was longer. And another thing, parenthetically, surprisingly, the, when they put the square sails on, the square sail model sailed up as, upwind almost as well as the one with the three lateen sails, which surprised me. But uh, they were clever people, and they figured out how to shape the square sails to get reasonable upwind performance out of that model as well. So now we start the first voyage. We've got the boats, we've got the crew, um, we've got pins on, uh, the boats are excellent, the crew is excellent. Uh, so we're off and running. So the lead, three ships leave for pa from Palo, Spain on August 2nd for their 10 week voyage. The first leg of the voyage is south, southwest one of those points on the compass uh, card uh, to the Canary Islands. This lines them up with the insight that enabled success, sailing far enough south to pick up the trade winds. Uh, that, when you think of it, really was his ace in the hole. And in about three weeks, he's in the Canary Islands. 
they stay there for about 10 days, refitting Nina with a couple of new masks for square rigging and square rigging. As I explained earlier, the teen sails would have been dangerous sailing exclusively downwind. They also restock provisions. And on the 6th of September, the, uh, they should leave San Sebastian, blah, 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 de la Gomera, CI, Canary Islands for the Far East. I keep getting confused and thinking they're sailing to <laughs> Bermuda, which they do, but you have to keep remembering they're going to the Far East. Um, and now we come to the science behind the trade winds, which was actually, the, the, as I've said many times, the key to his getting there. So they pick up the trade winds, which even though he was a little far north, they pick up for the entire voyage. So Columbus was doubly right when it comes to the committees. The uh, winds blew from the east and they were consistent uh, across the entire Atlantic, both of which the committee doubted would happen. So exactly why do the trades blow east and the westerlies blow west? The basic answer is uneven heat from the sun and the Coriolis of course, but, and the pole are high for the westerlies, but now we're going to look at a picture which explains it in a bit more detail. This is obviously the globe. And these, you can see on, on the latitudes he was sailing in, you can see the word Hadley cell. A guy named Hadley was the first one to explain this. And you can see the circle, or not a circle, but you can see off to the right in the Hadley cell, the air is heated at the, uh, what is it, intertropical convergence zone, as it's labeled here. I think of it as the equator. I guess the equator is, there's not that much wind there, but, and the high is the horse latitudes, not much wind there, but in between are the easterlies and westerlies. The, so the sun heats the air, they go up, and then start traveling north until they get in the, get knocked down at the horse latitudes by the polar high. Uh, as, and then they come back down and travel down to the equator and they keep circling uh, and around the entire globe, both north and south of the equator. And the Coriolis of force pushes the uh, air to the east in this case, no, west, <laughs> the west, the air is blowing from the east, so they'd be called easterlies. And every so often I get confused about how wind is labeled. Was it where it's going or coming from? And uh, it's where it's coming from. Um, so in this case, they're coming from the east, so they're easterlies. In the, our latitude and that of Spain, they're westerlies, the mid well, mid latitude cell. So that's how the easterlies uh, and the westerlies develop. And the next side provides an explanation that I just gave off the top of my head uh, relative to that picture. Um, the only thing to add is that the air is moving north at about 10 to 15 kilometers uh, high and descends in the, uh, what the, the subtropics and returns to the equator. And the westerlies are doing the same thing in, in our latitudes. Um, so next we looked at the currents, another bit of science. The North Atlantic, I don't know how to, gyre, I hope. And uh, we go into this because they were there. I doubt Columbus was terribly aware of them or aware of them at all. Uh, actually, I have proof of that, which we'll see shortly. Um, and so quickly going to the next slide to see that you can see it's a counter, uh, a, a clockwise uh, circle around the North Atlantic, where it goes to the North, you get the Gulf, everyone begins with the Gulf Stream, 
then the North Atlantic current, then his, the ones he's interested in are the Canary, Canary current, going to the Canary Islands, and the North Equatorial current, which goes back to the Caribbean. So back to this slide. So um, the, the basically you could see from that diagram that Columbus had the current in his favor 100% of the time and two factors were very much in his favor. One, they were weak, and two, they were going in his direction. His method of navigation would not have worked at all if uh, they had been cross currents or strong currents. And I doubt he knew this, but luckily he, they, were, they were slow and in his direction. So the gyre is usually considered to begin with the Gulf of, in the Gulf of Mexico. And an interesting factoid to me, at least, is well, two. One, there's almost no water comes from the Gulf of Mexico, which you might guess at. And the Gulf Stream is typically 62 miles wide and 2,600 to 4,000 feet deep. And its fastest travels at a speed of 5.6 miles per hour. If Columbus had somehow snuck through the Bahamas and hit this, boy, would he have been in for a surprise. And uh, I can testify to that. I sailed on it in my trip and uh, it got pretty exciting. And uh, the amount of water, if you figure that out, do the math, it's uh, a huge amount of water. The volume of the Gulf Stream dwarfs all rivers that empty into the Atlantic combined. And in general, make, uh, you'll, okay, I'll, I'll go over uh, how lucky he was later. Um, well, why he was lucky. <laughs> so here we are with the gyre again. Um, so now to continue in the science, this is the part, another part that very interested me. Actually, I was obviously most interested in why uh, air going around a sail makes you go forward. Um, and But this was next for me. Um, and how did he navigate? And and if you look at his path, if you, you probably don't remember it or didn't pay much attention to his entire trip, but one wonders, how did he find the Canaries? Now he's just sitting, then he's just sailing west and hitting the Bahamas. But then on the way back, he somehow finds the Azores. Uh, how the hell did he do that? Um, and I mean, he took all those classes in, in uh, Portugal, in Lisbon, but it just amazes me he could do it because, as it says here, Columbus used dead reckoning with a compass and a half hourglass to tell the time to do all his navigation. I found that very hard to believe, but that's what he did. <laughs> Every book said that. Dead reckoning, if you don't know, means you just use your compass heading and speed which you estimate, in his case, to determine your position at all times. This gets a little lengthy, I know, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I used dead reckoning on a 100-mile leg of a, off a cruise off the coast of New Jersey. It was night. And after 100 miles or so, I ended up less than a mile off the mark using no other means of navigation. I had a GPS, but it didn't work. And uh, so, and also, I used pretty much used just dead reckoning for my cruise in red, if you remember, from Road Town to Miami. However, I must admit, I had the distinct advantage of having a sextant to check my position. If I gave this in person, I was going to show you that I still have it, and a little bit how it works. Um, I usually took two sites a day, one at noon, solar noon, which was usually, I knew was going to be pretty, very accurate, and another later in the afternoon just to check and see if I could do it. But actually, I was always surprised how small my course corrections were as a result of the 
uh, sex degrees. In other words, almost nil. So I was basically dead reckoning, was working uh, very accurately. I had the advantage of a knot meter that uh, Columbus didn't have to guess distances. And, and obviously you're integrating over the day your the, the speeds you think you're going. But I don't count those as corrections. Another factor in our favor and his was that the currents and tides are very weak. The tides are about a foot in that area. The point of all this is that dead reckoning, even at long distances, works pretty well, or surprisingly well, I should say, because errors cancel, assuming consistent helmsmanship. Uh, so, basically, Columbus was guesstimating the boat speed, but he is pretty good at it. There's, I don't know if I should, uh, there was a famous story uh, that he kept two sets of books, one showing what he thought was the correct distance, and another showing shorter distance to placate the crew, because um, there were a few mutinies. Um, it's ironic that, uh, at least in this shorter story, in this famous story, in all the books I read, the shorter distance turned out to be closer to reality. I mean, independently, I thought this seemed a little doubtful, because he had a class A crew, and with lots of experience and pins on was there they all were capable of guesstimating the speeds if they were paying attention anyway uh it turns out columbus did use celestial navigation a little bit mostly by just simply looking at the north star which should have been a beam at night on his right if you think about it a little I never read this anywhere, but I suspect he could visually determine that he wasn't too off the desired latitude just by looking at it. Probably wrong, but I think he probably could have. Parenthetically, I was always surprised at what I could do without instruments on my 18 or so trip sailing to, to the Caribbean. After the second day, I'd take my watch off and I could tell you within 10 minutes the time and I could tell you the weather just by looking at the clouds once I stopped paying attention to the weather forecasts. And also, Columbus could determine the time within about 15 minutes using the North Star at night. There's a trick to doing this, and he knew it. This slide, which I don't understand, but it shows how to do it, and he almost certainly did it. There's also a device that he had that at midnight, you'd line up with some stars and would tell you within about five minutes so I don't know if he did that, but he probably did. So basically he uh, used the North Star and just looking at it, even though there were devices similar to a sextant as we'll look at soon. Um, so, and uh, here we are. He tried using a quadrant. Did I mention that? Yeah, he tried using a quadrant uh, you may have gathered I'm not exactly glued to the slides. Um, and as a, which was a precursor to the sextant, but one time, one time he did it, he determined he was in Cape Cod. Obviously, he, he didn't know it. He didn't know the new world was there. And in his defense, no sea captain of this era was proficient with the quad. As you'll we'll see, it's impossible to use on a ship. Magellan took one of the few, like in 1522, if I recollect correctly, Magellan didn't know how to use a, a quadrant, and he took one of the few acknowledged world-class experts on his round-the-world voyage, uh, and he still couldn't get it to work except on land. If he wanted to know where he was, he had to find land, put his expert on land, and then the expert with the quadrant could... Um, I'll tell you my theory on how close he could get soon. Um, he also had another method using an eclipse, um, and which was very accurate. And he knew this method too, and he used it a couple of times, not on a boat, but on land. And uh, he failed dismally. And my guess is it's such a simple method, he just blew it intentionally, 
once again, never read it in the book, but this procedure is actually, oops, trivial. So, um, whoops, back the wrong way. Um, so, I find it hard to believe he could blow it twice. Okay, also, at the very end, there's other methods, wind, current, but he didn't know those waves. He didn't know water depth was much too deep and land within sight of it, but uh, he couldn't see land. So that's how other mariners navigated, not him. So um, here's that trick to figure out the time. And here are the pictures of the common navigation devices used by Portuguese navigators the quadrant and the astrolabe, which is pretty similar. And you'll very soon realize why the quadrant was pretty much useless on a ship. You suspended it uh, from the top on a string, so it hung straight down. And there was another nap, very slight string, uh, from which was suspended a weight. And you read your latitude on the scale at the bottom after you lined up the left edge with two sites with Polaris, i.e. the North Star. So now you can see why in a moving ship, this was pretty much hopeless. And uh, just to give it the accuracy you could achieve, this is me again guessing, the sextant divides each degree into 60 parts with that micro dial thing it has. And <clears throat> Happily, 60 parts of one degree is, means each uh, part is one nautical mile. That's how they came up with a nautical mile. And the sextant can actually do a tenth but that's of a nautical mile, but that's hopeless in practice. Um, utterly hopeless, I should say. So the quadrant could not hope to be this accurate. In my voyage in red, I was pleased if I was within 10 miles of my actual position when testing. I, I tested at times at the start and the end when I had uh, marks in my vicinity. Um, so, and the astral lab was similar. So, uh, my theory on the accuracy was with a narrow enough string and the degree, you might be able to divide the each mark each interval between the marks by four and come up with 15 nautical miles and you might even be able to get so my guess is you could be within 30 nautical miles of your actual latitude <clears throat> if you were good at it and I must admit I've heard of people who are incredibly good with sextants and on non-moving uh, things like a aircraft carrier and can be much more accurate than I was. <clears throat> so this uh, a little more science, which I'm probably going to I'm going to skip over uh, exact details. But um, Columbus knew this, and it does explain. I'll, I'll go through it a teeny bit of it um, to demonstrate how simple it is. And Columbus knew this very well. So. You determine the local time that the lunar eclipse starts and ends by direct observation. Then you compare your local time for that event against a local time at some distant place. Uh, the difference between two times is the difference in longitude. Presumably, you know the longitude of the uh, place you used, you, you determine the local time at. For example, if the eclipse starts at 8 p.m. where you are, say, Cuba, and the same eclipse starts at 1 a.m. Cadiz, wherever that is, um, <clears throat> you find there's a five-hour difference between the two, and that's 75 degrees. So you just add 75 degrees to Cadiz, and you know where you are. And also, as explains below, it's very easy to figure out the local time in in Cuba or the Caribbean. So he shouldn't, and he was hours off, so he shouldn't, there's just no explanation for someone as capable as he was for blowing it, in my mind, other than, uh, well, this is my theory, that he did it intentionally. Also, 
I ran into a few other navigation methods along the way. Um, this one is a stick chart. It was used in the Pacific when there are islands in the vicinity. And it shows the islands and currents and winds and waves, if you know how to interpret it, and allow you to navigate through the islands. Although, obviously, in my, at least in my mind, navigating when there's land is a lot easier than when there's no land. Um, the next device look, looks very useful to me, and uh, I would want to abuse it. It's called a Kamal. <laughs> it's a board, and you can see there's a rope and with some knots. And basically, you put the board out with your arms bent such that the board, um, you see Polaris right over the top and the horizon in the bottom. You put the knots in your mouth, and the knot tells you where you are. And the knot was placed there when you were in, I say it's a port, whenever you were in that port and you looked at Polaris and the horizon or you were off the port so you could see the horizon. And so thus you would use it, you would know you're on the same latitude as the port and presumably you knew whether to head east or west and you would go into the port. And this sounds kind of useful to me and the final one is something called the cross staff, which is pretty much the same as the Kamal, but it's easier to use, particularly on a topping ship. You just, it's the longer one slides around. And you do the, roughly the same thing as with the Kamal and where that ends up tells you that you're on the latitude of the mark you put on the stick. Hey Bob, just information for you. It's uh, 1130. Oh. So what, uh, not your fault, you forewarned us. Uh, so if people have to leave, I just want to let you know that it's 1130, but uh, go ahead. And how, okay. much more do you think, how much more do you think you have? About 15 That's minutes? 30 slides, probably a little more than that. I'm going, uh, I'm going, I practiced this last night and uh, I must admit at times I'm <laughs> going off on rips that I probably shouldn't have done. I just, something comes into my mind and I start talking about it. <laughs> it's because I, uh, you probably noticed I'm not exactly sticking slavishly to what's on the slides. That's so I'll keep going and nobody wants to listen. You, you'll get the, the slides soon when I put in where I got the, the information. Might as well tell you um, most you of it is. Okay, I won't do that. <laughs> that yep. That's fine. Just that uh, it's your call whether you want to continue going with this now. If it's another half hour, that's a little bit long for most people. If you want to continue going now or go to a, a reasonable place to stop and yeah. we can stop at a, a later date, your call. Yeah, I'm going to go to a reasonable place to stop because it's coming up. And then I'll, uh, you'll notice a correlation with where I'm stopping and our current situation. Uh, so a digression, a modern, technique to determine longitude without a clock. If you remember uh, the book um, Longitude where the guy developed the clock to tell the time so that the British Navy knew where it was um, and the struggle and it was in the 1750s I think and I think it was a guy named Harrison who did it. Uh, here's a method you, you don't need a clock which caught my interest and it's called the longitude by the method of lunar distance. And I'm just gonna summarize it. Basically, you determine the distance between the moon and uh, the sun. So you have to be able to see both at the time you do it. And then you do a sequence of incredibly complex calculations and it tells you your longitude. And in fact, uh, this is interesting, a guy named Joshua Slocum was the first to sack, circumnavigate the world alone, claimed he did it with no timepiece. He said he couldn't afford one. And in fact, he didn't have one. And uh, everyone was duly impressed. But about 10 years later, he admitted he knew this method and used it because he had a sextant. So uh, um, I just found it interesting that there is a method figuring out your longitude accurately with no timepiece. But obviously you are determining the time, but indirectly. So now the first voyage continues. It goes in uneventful fashion. Um, 
he was a bit north in the, I'm going to go a little quick, a bit north in the trade wind belt, but he didn't know that, and it didn't descend, the, the horse latitudes or didn't descend on him except for a day or two, so it uh, didn't matter. And he continued to navigate west using dead reckoning, which astonishes me. And here's the chart of the first half of his voyage, and you can see he was doing pretty well staying due west. On the other hand, uh, I don't mention it anywhere in the slides, but uh, it turns out his, this is from his log, and his log was lost. And the only, this is from someone who made a copy of it, and that person didn't know how to sail. <laughs> so everyone suspects the copy a little bit. But uh, it does show it's probably correct in most aspects. And uh, also at night, one wonders how did he keep the three ships together, given that two of them were faster than the other one. And at night they did stay together. And at Santa Maria, he would fire off cannons as cannon until they came back to him. And I threw this next uh, slide in because just because I find it interesting. It's how far you can see on the ocean at a certain height. The masts were about 80 feet high, uh, so you, or 40 feet. So you just add them, assuming someone would go up the mast to find each other, and you can see they would had to get within 10 miles to see each other, which is what I assumed they would do. And uh, <clears throat> I always find it interesting looking at this that as you go up higher and higher, the distance doesn't go much, grow that much. So, which isn't intuitive for me, but I'm sure they're correct. Um, so now for an interesting development. This is the second half of the voyage over to the Bahamas on the left. On the right, you see uh, he t suddenly takes a little jog to the north west, straightens out and comes back to his original path. And how can you explain that? That turns out to be very, turns out to be significant. If you remember, looked at the dates, I didn't, but on the 22nd and 23rd of September, he made that job. But presumably he was still following the compass due west. And he would observe the North Star is now closer to being directly ahead instead of on the starboard beam as it should be. And this story is in all the books, so I'm sure it's true. Being the clever fellow he is, he quickly correctly identifies the issue as magnetic declination, a completely unknown concept at the time, and heads west once again. I find this very impressive. So when you think about it, he not only found the new world, but he found the trade winds, belt of trade winds, which was roundly doubted, and he found magnetic declination. So, and the trade winds were, I'm sure, key to Magellan to be going around the world. So he was a pretty sharp fellow, in, in, in my opinion. So anyway, after his jaw, he proceeds west uneventfully, um, as I said, I, I keep wondering how he um, kept on such a westerly course and how he found the Azores, but he did. And, uh, and how he could guesstimate his speed so well. But the weather was on it in his favor. Usually it is. Everything seemed to go in his favor. But there were a few near men, mutinies. And on October 11th, there was the most severe one. And they almost carried the day and that he turned around, but he bargained for a couple more days. And if they didn't find land, this is October 11th. Within a, a day, a few hours, they started seeing grass and debris and land birds, which seems somewhat miraculous because the next day they hit land, October 12th uh, is the day he landed on Watling's Island um, in the Bahamas. 
And, oh, here's declination, a map of the declination uh, of all the world, around the world. If you look at it a little bit, you can see in the, um, not the Caribbean, the Mediterranean is zero. And it's not that bad off the coast. And it gets worse out in the middle of the Atlantic, or greater. In our neck of the woods, it's about 11 in degrees. Um, and... But when I'm sailing, I never pay any attention. I use compass course and just go with it <laughs> um, instead of using true. Um, so enough of that. So here's Watling's Island. He landed there. He sailed around it, found a good harbor, took a small boat, rode up to the top of the island, north, I guess, and... Uh, there they ran into some natives. The natives were very friendly and completely unclothed. And for me, I wondered, what did the natives think of them being completely clothed? And they're probably a little scruffy. Um, and also one wonders what the sailors thought of the nude uh, natives. But anyway, Columbus got along with them well and uh, tried to make friends and without being able to speak their language, managed to get across that he wanted gold. And where is gold? And they told him on Cuba. So he heads to Cuba. And now what? So he proceeds to Cuba and there there's no gold, but he meets more natives and they're friendly and unclothed. And so he heads and they say, go to Hispanola, Hispanola. Um, which is now Dominican Republic and Haiti. I don't know if it's still called Hispanola on any map. Um, and, but he does now label the, in, the, the natives or indigenous population uh, Indians, or I-N-D-I-O-S, Indios in Spanish, since I keep forgetting this, but he thinks he's on the outer islands of Japan or maybe India. He had little luck in India, in Cuba, and um, Espanol, he doesn't have any luck finding gold this time around. Um, and on Santa Maria, he famously um, runs aground on Christmas Eve. Uh, in his, def as I mentioned earlier, um, when I was concerned about the depth of the water, and when I was looking at it, but Columbus is asleep when it happens. And he would reportedly been awake for 48 straight hours, probably because he was worrying about that clear water. And uh, so the, the Santa Maria is a total wreck. And this ultimately forces him to leave 39 men behind in a settlement right there where he runs aground. But he hasn't turned into the ugly Columbus we probably heard about or has been in the press a bit or a lot um, and he because he goes to the leader of the natives in the area and gets permission to leave them there and he basically established good relations with all the indigenous people who are once again naked friendly and weaponless um, you have to remember that one of his main goals he, he thought important was to convert them to Christianity. He was a devout Catholic. And uh, so, um, and so, and also you have to remember, he hadn't let any of the natives who wanted to eat him yet. So he was inclined to be friendly. So here again, you can see his course and my red course. And you can see he goes along the Northern edge of Hispaniola and he gets to the north, what would be the northeast corner. And this is in January 13th or thereabouts, 1493 now. He runs into the, at the Bay of Rincon, which is, I don't think that's his name. He encounters uh, a distinctly unfriendly group of natives or Indians called the Sigianos. And they start shooting at him with bows and arrows. 
well, the arrows. And uh, and it will come to light later that these bow, these arrows and bows are quite a bit su are superior to their guns. But somehow he captures twenty five of them and takes them back, or, as he had done a few in a few other places, taken a few, and he takes them back to Spain with him. When Isabella and Ferdinand did not approve of this slavery and freed the ones that weren't shooting arrows at him because under Spanish law, it was illegal to enslave someone except a prisoner of war. So the ones shooting arrows did get enslaved, but only a few of them made it back. Um, so after this battle, this Columbus decided it's time to leave. Um, so quickly now to get to my break point, <laughs> um, on his way back, he's pointing, thus my discussion of sailing into the wind to the north, and then um, he hits the westerlies and sails downwind to back to Spain. On the way, he hits a hurricane and another storm. The hurricane is probably 50 to 55 knot winds. And this really amazes me. I have to remember the crew is sleeping on deck. Those waves, they're not particular. they wouldn't be high and steep out there because they're out in the middle of the ocean. They'd just be huge rollers and they're not breaking. So they're probably not breaking over the deck, but they're still going to be very impressive. And, uh, so it's amazing to me, no one was lost, everyone survives. The crew is freaked out. The uh, Columbus prom promises them all and himself that if he makes it, um, if they make it alive, they'll go to the Azores and pray at some, uh, con some religious site there. Um, and he comes through on that one. And just a, another little scientific tidbit that the hurricane reminds me that, uh, oh, here are the four courses. Notice uh, he, the blue one at the top, he go, hits the westerlies. Two of the other courses, he doesn't. And then the fourth one, I think he does go up to the westerlies. It makes you wonder if he really did understand this uh, circuit that, that he, the westerlies were west and the easterlies were east because the other two, he pointed back through the trade winds. That, so one wonders if he truly was a genius or not. No one knows exactly why he did this. And now we come to that point about reefing or the, in the heavier winds. He did have to worry about a concept of, the, he, he remember he worried about center of mass with rocks or something heavy in the bottom of the hull. And he had to worry about the center of effort and of the sails to keep his, keep uh, from being blown over. And the way they did it with, was with the square sails and they were done in sections, uh, as you can see. So they just take out sections if the winds got too heavy. My guess is on the uh, hurricane, he didn't even bother with this. He just took down all the sails and ran under bare poles. Um, and Hey, Bob, you think it's time? Yeah, um, just this slide, and that'll be it, okay? Sold. So his reception in Europe, he was ret returned as the conquering hero. He landed in Lisbon by mistake, but there was another storm. Interestingly, he met with King John, who he was, very, he was friends with. An enemy he had there tried to kill him, but as usual, he lucked out, and the king saved him because... He somehow learned of the plot. Um, then he, so then he goes back to Palos. He's freed, fated like royalty or a god. His accomplishments spread throughout Europe like wildfire. And he quickly organizes the second voyage to claim the riches he says are there, i.e. he really put the best uh, face on what he found, that, he's, you know, that he had found the islands just would have been uh, west, no, east of uh, Japan, and he found riches beyond, well, not beyond imagination, but riches. <laughs> and so he 
quickly organized a second voyage with, I believe, what, something like 17 ships and colonists and military and horses. Thus began the uh, Columbian Exchange. And um, I think that's the best breaking point. Uh, he's got to the new world. He's come back. He's now, well, he would be credited with magnetic declination, the trade winds, the uh, opening up the new world uh, as opposed to discovering it. And uh, then, so the, the next part would, is the pandemic, I mean, the uh, Colombian exchange. And uh, you'll find out if we do this, my paranoia about the pandemic we're in. <laughs> um, so I think I better stop here because it would be another 15 minutes to go to the end. Thank you, sir. Very well okay. done. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Bob, what kind of boat did you have? Do you have? Right now? Yeah. A Pearson 34. Uh-huh. Don Nelson, I've sailed uh, the Bermuda 1-2 a dozen times. Ooh, I've never done that. I just, I actually, my trip, the red one, uh, convinced me I don't want to sail overnight ever again. <laughs> and... Uh, not that I was afraid, and I did it off New Jersey. I, I didn't particularly want to, but a major uh, storm was gonna about to hit us, and uh, I didn't want to be where I was, so I said, I think we better do this tonight instead of uh, waiting for tomorrow, so we did. But it wasn't my first choice. Actually, I did sail on a boat once that won that race. It was pretty exciting oh, in its class. Boy, it was impressive how it sailed, I mean, it, the, boat? The, the boat that won the Bermuda race in its class, but oh, okay. the difference, and I've sailed on a 12 meter, and it's just incredible when you don't care about the quarters below, what a, how well a boat can sail.